Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. I think we expect a lot of folks on today's webinar. Uh, my name is Eric Dernbach. I am an advisory committee member for the Labor Research and Action Network, which we call LRAN. And um, for those who don't know, LRAN is a national network and, and a project of Jobs with Justice. Uh, and it's a network of um, union researchers and worker center and community organization staff and labor academics. It was founded, I think over a decade ago, I think maybe 12 years ago, as a way to you know, kind of uh, grow a network of strategic researchers and campaigners, educate each other, share best practices, learn about research and campaign tools. And um, uh, people are still joining, okay. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just pause for a second. Um, yeah, so, and I think the network has, you know, well over a thousand folks around the country. Um, folks can find out more about the group at lranetwork.org. And there are, I think a lot of folks that are on the call today that were uh, at the recent LRAN 12th annual conference that we held in Georgetown, uh, which we were just at last week. Uh, it was a really great conference. And again, it's a, a time for all of us to gather to kind of hear updates on campaigns and um, see what's going on in the kind of research network. Yeah, I was muted for a second. Um, yeah, I, re I really enjoyed it. So once again, um, this webinar was hosted by the Labor Research and Action Network. And um, you can find out more information at lranetwork.org um, and get sign up on the listserv. And you can also then find out about next year's conference. Um, another thing that LRAN does is we like to host webinars about kind of important organizing and union related topics uh, over the course of the year on our website. I think we have recordings of 10 past webinars or so. So we're really excited to have Bob and John on today. I think folks that follow labor news, understand that there's kind of a whole industry of union busting consultants that are out there. And maybe we see various articles about them, but probably most of us never really have enough time to dig in and find out as much about these folks as, as we would want. And I think also a lot of us recognize that there are these government <laughs> department of labor forms that one could find about these folks. And again, I know I've looked at them sometimes, but I never I never look at them as much as I'd like to. So, so it's really great um, that Bob and John are on uh, the experts in this area that could really uh, tell us what we need to know about this. So I'm gonna hand it over to Bob and John. And I'll also say that folks can just put questions as they come up in the Q&A channel. Uh, and after uh, Bob and John are done, we'll have time for, for questions and answers. So take it away, Bob. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. Um, my name is Bob Funk. I'm the director and founder of Labor Lab. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to say how great it was to meet many of you in Georgetown earlier this month, and um, that it's really been amazing to become part of this extraordinary um, community. Um, you have to understand that I originally come from the communications world, so I depended on researchers doing the hard work so that we could get our message out there. Um, it's really exciting to be uh, doing this work right now, the strategic research and communications part of it, and um, LRAN has been such an asset and so valuable um, to us in this effort. Uh, before we get started, I just kind of wanted to build on what Eric had said um, and really kind of put some things into context. And then I'll kick it over to uh, John Lund, who is l literally the expert when it comes to anti-union persuaders. I mean, hell, he literally wrote the book on it and I'll put a link to that in the chat once I'm done um, talking and um, we can get to the real work of how to document this and build campaigns around um, anti-union persuasion. Um, but first I just wanted to give a little context. Um, Labor Lab was born, um, our mission was born out of an experience of mine a few years ago, um, working for the largest union in, um, the interior West um, in Montana. Uh, Republicans swept the state politically for the first time in two decades. Um, despite that, we managed to defeat every anti-union piece, anti piece of legislation in the legislature. 
um, including right to work, one of the first states to do that with, uh, with a trifecta of Republicans. And the reason we were able to do that is by leaning into the rights and freedoms of workers to join unions. And it was really about values. Um, so Labor Lab began doing some national work where we were putting out easily digestible information about Section 7 rights and how to start a union and understanding that it is a fundamental right to start a union. But as everyone on this call knows, that is really just part of the problem. The biggest reason that we're seeing union density fall and union membership fall is because of employer resistance. Um, and this really shouldn't be happening. We all know that 70% of Americans support unions. Millions want to be in a union. So what is standing in their way? It's employer resistance. So we really had to start highlighting the employers that are violating these fundamental rights in the workplace and calling them out because they are on the wrong side of not only the law, but also public opinion. As you all know, unionization is imposed um, by employers in the vast majority of cases, and the use of what are called anti-union persuaders um, is the rule, not the exception. John, during his presentation, will go over what the definition of a persuader really is, something that we're obviously trying to change as an organization, but we can get into that um, a little bit later, um, maybe in John's presentation or in the Q&A. Um, Q the other important thing to note here is that the main tactic used by anti-union persuaders is captive audience meetings. Um, this is uniquely troubling because there's research that shows that there's a inverse correlation between captive audience meetings, excuse me, holding captive, audi captive audience meetings and the success of workplace uh, democracy campaigns. Um, so we know that not only are they being used, but generally their tactics are effective and the more, more uh, the sooner an employer uses them and the more often they use them, the more successful they are in defeating uh, workers and their attempts to form a union. Um, so to effectively combat union busting, we first have to um, start addressing the issues of persuaders. This is just the first step. This is the foothold. This is the tip of the iceberg. This is the cat's tail that we can actually grab onto and try to pull the entire industry into the light. And that's because of the laws that actually are in place. The problem with um, our current situation is most of the public, heck, a lot of unions don't even know about the hired consultants that are being brought in. Um, they have, we all know about Starbucks and we all know about Amazon, but we don't know about the hundreds of other employers that are bringing people into union bust. In fact, 80% um, of union busting campaigns uh, and union anti-union persuasion goes unreported until after the fact and it's too late. Um, we've put out a report on this. John Lund's research um, was huge in this part, and we are putting a lot of pressure on the U.S. Department of Labor and the Office of Labor Management Standards to really start uh, start uh, enforcing the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act, uh, which as anyone here that's part of a union knows, we have to file our LM2s and all of that, but there's a very special form, um, LM20, that Congress was very specific about that anti-union persuaders needed to file with the Department of Labor within 30 days so that workers had information in a timely manner and they could make the best decision. Unfortunately, eight out of 10 times, uh, uh, anti-union persuaders avoid this rule. So um, we're kind of being a little bit of, uh, we're bringing a lot of attention to this, uh, to the U.S. Department of Labor. And we are seeing some um, progress on that front to tackle the crisis level of non-compliance that's going on um, in labor law. Uh, we're also pushing for the reinstatement of the persuader rule. Um, we think that that would be, at least the Biden administration could send a very clear signal with that. Um, we are asking the department to rescind the LM21 special enforcement policy, and we're regularly doing the work of the OMS, filing complaints with OMS when um, these anti-union persuaders violate the law. 
Um, this is all to get us to the next step, which is what we recently launched, what we're calling our, what we call the early warning system, which enables us to analyze these Department of Labor filing documents and then alert unions, the public and the media uh, when companies hire anti-union persuaders. And this is really, really powerful work. I mean, we're seeing firsthand the impact that it makes on the shop floor, worker centers, um, and also media. I mean, we're getting coverage of union busters in small towns in the South. Um, that have never run articles about employers hiring union busters before because no one's paid attention to these documents in the past. Um, so far, it, already this year, the initiative has brought to light uh, 87, yeah, 87 employer resistance campaigns involving, involving professional union busters. We're, I'm looking at four new ones today, so we're going to be breaking 90, it looks like, by the end of the week. Um, and through this program, we've collaborated with unions, uh, on the ground, worker centers, and the press. Um, I do want to just take a quick aside. Um, I'd be remiss to not acknowledge Brad Murray with AFT and his work with uh, union busting alerts. His attention to anti-union persuaders um, has really helped um, inspire and um, expand what we think is achievable here. So this is really the next logical step of a lot of the amazing work that Brad Murray's done over the years. And I'm very appreciative of all the advice um, and guidance he's given us to date. So um, again, before we really jump in the weeds and John Lund's gonna do an amazing job um, explaining how everyone on this call can do similar to work to what Labor Lab's doing. I know most of you don't have the capacity to do this work. So please send it our way. That's what we're trying to do. We want to take it on for you. I'm very thankful to um, our, we've got local supporters all over the country. We've got national supporters, including AFA, CWA, FT, Teamsters, Boilermakers. We're really appreciative of all that support and we want to help do the heavy lifting here for you. But again, this is the tip of the iceberg. The more people that know how to use these tools, the more likely we're actually going to be able to bring this industry into compliance with the law, the more likely we're going to be able to actually see victories in workplaces um, that are trying to organize, and the better we're going to be able to um, call out employers that infringe on workers' rights instead of just letting them get away with it. Um, and, you know, the documents just disappearing into the bureaucracy and never being seen again. Um, okay, so before we get into our crash course on John Lund, I really, I want to just give you a little context about who he is. Uh, he literally wrote the book on anti-union persuasion. Um, again, I'm going to put a link to it in the chat once I'm done yakking, um, but a second edition is coming out and I'll put my email in there. So if you're interested in it, I will personally send you a copy of the book once it's published. Um, John Lund it was um, OMS director under President Obama. One of the things that I found most exciting that he did was the Persuader Reporting Orientation Program, which the it, OMS takes the proactive step, believe it or not, of reaching out um, when an NLRB election is taking place and informing employers of their reporting, employers of their reporting duties. So hopefully if they hire an anti-union persuader, their um, uppity HR person will say, well, you, you've got to file these documents. And we did see it make a difference under the Obama um, compliance with the LMRDA with anti-persuasion consultants increased. Um, uh, no surprise to anyone here, Trump got rid of it and compliance dropped. It has been reinstated um, by the current director, and we're hoping that stays in place. But God forbid whatever happens in 2024, Labor Lab is going to be there to continue to push for strong compliance. Um, now John is Professor Emeritus at the Schools of Workers, at, of Workers, excuse me, of the University of Wisconsin. Um, I just cannot thank uh, John for all of his expertise and helping Labor Lab get where we are today and making national and local impacts. And I really hope that everyone finds this as informative as we do because we're obsessed with these forums. There's such a treasure trove of information here that can be used and used effectively in organizing campaigns. And I'd love to talk to, if my information will be in the chat, 
I'd love to give people more examples, whether it's de-cert campaigns, organizing campaigns, worker center fights. We've been involved in all of them. And these pieces of paper that get filed with OMS have made the difference. So with that, I will uh, shut up and Kate get over to Professor Lund. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Bob and uh, Eric. Let me see if I can get my uh, um, PowerPoints up here. Here we are. Okay, the um, persuader activity is a very um, kind of an artificial definition. Um, it's um, a creature of both law and practice. Um, when I was director of OLMS, we uh, tried to broaden the rule of current interpretation is a reportable persuader arrangement involves direct contact uh, between the employees and the persuaders. Um, if there is no direct contact, if the uh, persuader stays in the background and trains supervisors, writes campaign literature, plans strategy, it's not reportable. Um, so there's a bit of a conflation going on. Um, research by Bronfenbrenner and others has shown that, uh, you know, anywhere 70 to 80 percent of employers hire uh, consultants in campaigns. Um, that does not mean 80 percent of them owe persuader reports, because, again, if there is no direct contact with the workers, it's not reportable. Um, in addition to that, there's an advice exception in the law, which makes uh, a co consultation between attorneys and employers uh, uh, a safe harbor. So that's not reportable either. So there's uh, it's a very narrowly circumscribed area of reporting. But be that as it may, uh, we know that there's a lot of uh, direct contact going on that's not being reportable. And that's why I think the work of Labor Lab and, and, and Brad and others is so important in that uh, we really need to make sure that OLMS is aware of this and uh, take steps to get the persuaders to file the reports, um, which usually is, is quite easily done when evidence is presented to the persuaders that they've been engaged in that activity. Um, there's little else they can do but file the form. Um, OLMS has recently announced via its blog, its new director, uh, Jeff Freund, who's a uh, former attorney, or he still is an attorney, but he practiced with Bredoff and Kaiser, the uh, probably the largest labor law firm in the country. Um, and he's announced that he, they want to increase um, reporting and disclosure. Uh, the way he put it was to put the M back in LMRDA. And LMRDA, again, stands for Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act. Um, and um, they're also trying to work on uh, reporting employer uh, unfair labor practice expenditures. Uh, that's an area that is addressed in uh, the new book uh, that will be coming out soon. I have a, a chapter on how that might occur. It's uh, it's really interesting area. Um, this is the first page of what the form looks like. And I, I, I realize it's not fun to look at forms, but um, the key information begins with a person filing. This is the persuader form filed by the, the persuader with a reportable relationship within 30 days of entering into that agreement. So they've got to put their name and address, um, any other address where the records are kept. Now, this part three is useful to you because many times these companies have changed names, uh, changed locations. Uh, several of them literally operate out of a UPS store or a post office box. Um, so being able to track them down to a different physical location sometimes is very useful. Uh, we do have the ability to check out whether or not they're appropriately registered as a corporation. Uh, we've uh, identified several who are not, and those matters have been uh, dealt with through state corporations offices. Uh, we recently came across one who... Uh, Claimed they were a Florida corporation, but they had lost their corporation registration several years ago. I'm sure that was a great interest to the Florida Corporation's office when they were notified. The date the employer's fiscal year ends is important because there's a second form the consultants have to file. It's called an LM21, which I'll get to next. That's a year-end report, and that one is due 90 days from the close of the uh, consultant's fiscal year. 
Lastly, the, uh, uh, the consultant here has to identify whether they're a sole proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation. Increasingly, many of them are corporations, limited liability corporations uh, primarily, uh, but this is useful because when it comes to the signature line down here, if uh, it is a corporation or a partnership, the chief uh, executive officer, the president signs here, and the chief financial officer signs here. Uh, now, these forms must be filed electronically, so the uh, electronic time and date stamp is placed on them when they're filed. Um, and then lastly, in item seven, very, very important, what date was the persuader relationship entered into? And the, the, that's what starts the 30-day clock for reporting. So you just basically, if you're writing a spreadsheet, you put that date in the cell, you'd add 30 days, that's the due date. Um, Thanks to Bob, we've been able to download data for uh, 2020, 2021, and 2022, and we have found that of the LM20s filed during that period, only 21.6% were filed within the 30 days. And as Bob correctly points out, you know, the longer it goes between you know, the, the, the arrangement being entered into and the form being filed, the workers have no idea, the union has no idea, and uh, literally, it's, it's like the Wizard of Oz operating behind the curtain until little Toto comes along and pulls back the curtain. Um, it, we don't know who's really talking and who's paying for it. So that's very good information that can be gleaned from these forms. They're very accessible. And then there's two purposes in the box nine here. You can be either hired to persuade or to supply the employer with information concerning the activities of workers or labor organizations. Um, this involves surveillance, basically. If you're bringing in an outside consultant to take videos, uh, to develop uh, software to spy on employees or the union, uh, to research the union, this box gets checked. It also requires a, a written persuader arrangement uh, and more on that in just a minute. Now here in item 10, this is one that's very, very problematic. Um, the terms and conditions, which means what are you going to get paid per day, per hour, per week? What are your expenses? What services will be performed and when? Most frequently, those of you who have looked at an LM20, and Bob has looked at a lot of them, so has Brad, um, will just have boilerplate language about educating employees about their Section 7 rights. That's just, it, it's not helpful at all. And if there is a written arrangement, it must be attached. Now, now, here's something that I just think is, is really funny. Can you imagine as a corporation entering into an agree agreement with a third party, hiring them and not putting the terms and conditions in writing? I, I honestly can't. Now, I, I've checked with my auditor friends and they say, well, you know, it's probably a good idea, but it's not like required. Well, I, I can just imagine if a CPA came in and audited the corporation and said, you paid $100,000 to this consultant, where's your written agreement as to what they were supposed to be paid? How do we know that they were overpaid or underpaid? Without a written agreement, you don't have that. So there's, there's a, you know, th this is something that we'll check and show you how to check to see if there is a written agreement. Quite frankly, very few employers today or very few consultants bother to include it. But when they do, and it spells out what the terms and conditions are, it's an excellent piece of paper to put into the hands of the workers you're trying to organize because uh, they can see in writing, signed by the consultant, signed by the employer, this is how much this individual is getting paid. They're also supposed to spell out the nature of the activity, what are they gonna do, over what period of time, has it been performed? And then in 11D, this is frequently misunderstood. Any individuals who are hired as subcontractors or employees of the persuader have to be itemized here and it has to be kept current. Now, increasingly the business model we see with persuaders is that they exclusively contract out their work. So it might be LRI or culture, uh, but none of the people that are listed in 11D are employees of that company. They in fact are subcontractors. So it's very much like you know, construction, which is my background, I'm an operating engineer, where the, uh, you know, the, the prime contractor contracts out all the work and the, the, the general contractor serves like a manager. 
And the data we've been analyzing suggests that these consultants, the prime contractors, are taking probably 50% of what they charge and then paying the rest to the subcontractors. So it's, it's quite interesting what's developing here. Um, again, the full name and address and affiliation of each subcontractor or employee must be listed here. The subject group of employees, what is the prospective bargaining unit? And then what labor organizations? Now, many times you'll see this left blank or NA. Uh, certain consultants like LRI get brought in even before there is a union petition that's filed with the NLRB. Uh, sometimes it will just say generically Teamsters without giving a local union. Uh, more on that later. But that's the kind of information that can be gleaned from you know, the LM20 if it's correctly filled out. Now, oftentimes we'll see that certain stuff is missing or incorrect, and those are brought to the attention of OLMS, and we've had some pretty good luck getting amended reports to be filed. So some good news on that front. But once again, it's it, the consultants who don't bother to file this are really creating a problem. And I should point out that if you are a subcontractor spelled out in 11D, you in turn must file an LM20. So the prime contractor who enters the arrangement with the employer files an LM20, and then the subcontractors enumerated also file an LM20. And we see a lot of that happening now because essentially there's a generational shift going on in the industry. The big guns are sort of you know passing the torch to a new group. We're seeing a huge increase in the number of LM20s with new consultants whose names we don't recognize. And they're not doing a very good job, most of them, of filing the LM20 reports. This is the LM21, the annual report. And you'll note here, it, it shows the beginning and ending dates of the consultant's fiscal year, um, the name who's filing it, their title, uh, where do they keep the records. Um, under the LMRDA, consultants, employers must keep the records necessary to file these reports for a minimum of five years after the year in which the forms were filed. So these records have to be maintained. There's room for signature line here. Uh, frequently we'll see just one signature name. And that's why we go back and check and see on the LM20, are they a corporation? Because a corporation requires the president and the treasurer to sign. So does an LLC. If we see just the president's name signed and they're listed as an LLC, we bring it to OLMS's attention and say the form is deficient. Now, that might appear to some of you to be kind of uh, nitpicky. Uh, that's one word for it. Um, and um, I don't think it is because, quite frankly, if OLMS follows through on it, it means they're going to, at a minimum, call up the consultant and say, your form is deficient. You need to file a new report. The more we can bring these persuader consultants out into the open, show them that people are reading these forms, the more likely they are to file them completely and timely. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is a good thing because we want as many of these things out there as possible because we accumulate so much knowledge from every single filing. Now the signature line here, I just wanna dwell on this for a second. Each of the undersigned declares, and this is on all the forms, the 20, the 21, and the 10, declares under penalty of perjury and other applicable penalties of law that all of the information submitted in this report, including the information containing the accompanying documents, has been examined by the signatory and is, to the best of the undersigned's knowledge and belief, true, correct, and complete. There are penalties for false filing. So in other words, the value of these forms isn't just that they're publicly available but that they're subject to perjury. So any information that's contained in here, you can take to the bank. Now, if you were to throw an LM20 or 21 at an employer and say, look at this guy, they can't just say, oh, that's all made up crap. No, this is information. And you can say to them, what part of here is not accurate? We want to bring it to the attention of the federal government. There may be federal legal liability here. Um, so that's a good thing. Now, the employers, are, the consultants are supposed to report receipts, um, all receipts from all employers. So if you have 10 reportable relationships, there's going to be 10 of these addresses of employers. And note, the total amount received 
and then in disbursements, payments to officers and all other expenses. Now, here's the problem. Bob mentioned the OLMS special enforcement policy. In 2016, OLMS unilaterally declared that employers or that consultants would not be prosecuted if they left part B and part C blank. Now, I, I, I this was after my spell as director. I left in 2013. For the life of me, I cannot understand why they gave them this pass. Because if they don't have to itemize the receipts from the employers, the only way you can learn how much they get paid from the employers is a form called the LM-10. And it's often valuable to cross-match the LM-21 with the LM-10 to see what the consultant says they got paid versus what the employer said they paid the consultant. Um, but what I have found in researching LM-21 filings is that about you know, half of them haven't been filed so far. And how do we know how many are owed? Because if you file one LM-20, you owe an LM-21 for that fiscal year. So we know how many are owed, we know how many are filed, and then we examine the ones that are filed for a particular year, and we find that about half of those who file still itemize receipts. So that's very, very useful. But then the really important part is down here in D. As I mentioned, most consultants today are hiring out or subcontracting out the work. So every payment to a subcontractor has to be reported in Schedule D. Now, some consultants who do hire subcontractors, and how do we know that? Because they're itemized in the 11D of the LM20s that they file. You see, what we do is we cross-match every LM21 with all of the LM20s. And that's how we pick up the unreported stuff and bring it to OLMS's attention. But you know, when you start to look at who's getting paid out, it's typically the same you know, band of suspects, the usual suspects, as uh, they said in uh, Casablanca. And uh, they, you have to know who, who got paid and what was the amount. So the total payments to the subcontractors, that's not covered by the special enforcement policy. Only part B, itemized receipts, part C, itemized disbursements have to, ha, are, not, are, are covered by the special enforcement policy. Part D, it's still covered. So if you were to look at a big consultant like Culture or LRI, you'll find pages and pages and pages of these uh, consult subcontractors that are listed. And it's very, very illuminating when you start to build dossiers, as we have been building dossiers on consultants and subcontractors, because we know how much they got paid each year. Now, I should also add that these same subcontractors, guess what? They also have to file an LM21. So we can cross match the LM21s filed by the prime contractors with those of the subcontractors. And that has always yielded up some very interesting results. Lastly, here's the form LM10. This is the form filed by the employer. And like the LM21, it's due within 90 days of the close of the employer's fiscal year. The fiscal year beginning and ending dates are spelled out right here in item two. Here's the name of the employer. Any other addresses? What kind of organization are they? And again, signed by the president and the treasurer. The same declaration about penalty of perjury is found here as it is in the LM20 and 21. Now, in this particular report, the LM10 is a multi-purpose report. Sections 203A and 203B of the LMRDA talk about employer reports. So when you look at all the LM10 reports, they may not all report about persuaders. In fact, uh, looking at the 2020 to 2022 reports, there were about 1,430 of them. Uh, about 60% of the boxes checked were for this one, payments that are made to a union or a union official. And typically these are things like reimbursement to attend a conference. Uh, sometimes the company provides an office to the union. Uh, these are things that have to be reported. Um, B, is a payment that's made to employees of the employer to engage in persuasion. So in part B is employee persuasion. Part C is 
employer expenditures for committing unfair labor practices. And part D is uh, employees being involved in surveillance of other employees. Now, before you get all you know, excited about this, let me just say the same data set I analyzed of 2020 through 2022 filings. Again, Bob's group requested, filed a FOIA to get this from OLMS. Uh, I, they passed it on to me, I analyzed it. I did not find a single bona fide filing for th that three year period. No checking of B, C, or D. So the second most checkbox was E, which is persuader activity. That's about 39% of all the, the stuff that gets reported. That and E, which is um, the persuader research or persuader surveillance. So those boxes are checked. That's what you're looking for when you look at the form. And then in here, the last page, you have to list the name of the persuader, their name and address, the, the, the agreement date, 10A, which we compare with item seven, which is what the consultant says the date was. And was it oral, written, or both? If it's written, then you have to attach the agreement. Sometimes we'll have the persuaders not report the agreement, but the employer does. So it's useful to look at the LM10s. But as you can see, folks, the big problem is the LM20s are filed within 30 days of entering into the arrangement. The LM10s are filed literally a year later within 90 days of the close of the fiscal year. Oh, and by the way, if you think we have a delinquency problem with LM10s, 20s being filed on time, we have a similar problem with LM10s as well, not being filed. OLMS has got a lot of work to do to get caught up on all these ones. We keep identifying them. Now, how do we identify LM10s in a row? We search a given year, 2020, 2021, 2022. We identify an employer mentioned in an LM20. We then cross match that to see if they filed an LM10. If they haven't, that's a no match that gets reported to OLMS. Um, we are getting making some progress in these, but uh, it's not happening fast enough. Now here in the next page, the itemization of the payments, they've got to put the date they made the payment. Now, when you cross match this with NLRB election data, you get some really interesting things. Um, the amount of the payment, and that's rounded to the nearest dollar and whether it was an ACH, uh, check, credit card, however, and then the circumstances of the payments. So you can see if you were able to cross match LM10s, LM20s, and LM21s, you have a tremendous amount of information. And I must say that Labor Lab, uh, in working with them, has got the best compilation, the most comprehensive compilation of anybody that I'm aware of. And it, we're going to keep it that way because information is power. Okay, how do you look these up? Well, you go to the OLMS website. So let me uh, take a minute here and see if I can uh, find that. Tell you what, let me get through the rest of these materials. I'm, I'm kind of running low on time, but I'm sure many of you have used it. Um, you can get these PowerPoints from, from Bob and uh, just click the link. It's already active and go to the disclosure room. Here's what it looks like. The LM10 reports, uh, the 20s and 21s. Actually, the 20s and 21s are in the same database. So click one of those. And here's what will come up. I'm going to look for an LM10. This is what the search screen looks like. And you can just type in the employer name. Forget about the file numbers. OLMS is supposed to assign them a unique file number. Most employers have 10 or 20 different file numbers. The same is true with the, uh, with the consultants. It's even worse. So I, I decided to just pick a, um, a, a case that I was somewhat involved in. This involved uh, Colectivo uh, Coffee Roasters in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This was IBW Local 494 and its uh, sister local. Uh, and they, they put on a pretty good campaign. Uh, so we pull up their LM10s and we notice that we get two hits. We click the active link here and we can pull up uh, the LM10 reports. And with that, we can see how much they got paid. And we can also pull up the LM20 uh, reports. Just go to that. You don't even have to type the whole name and you can pull up this one, JV uh, Employee Solutions, which is a brand new one based out of Portland, Oregon. 
Uh, and you'll notice here, here's our LM21 report, not required to complete special enforcement policy. So some of these consultants are just flaunting it in, in our face that, hey, we don't have to report anything other than just fill out the form. Uh, it's very, very annoying. And uh, Labor Lab has been very, very uh, good about urging people and has a petition drive to get OLMS to rescind the special enforcement policy. That would just open things up for us so much if all of the consultants had to itemize their receipts and disbursements. Um, because you know, if we don't have employer LM10s being filed by everyone, then the only other source we have of information about how much employers are spending and how much persuaders are getting paid is the LM10. And that's, that's just not good enough. Now I'm gonna kind of open up a new area here which is the NLRB case activity documents. Um, several years ago, when I after I left the agency and I had my own consulting business, uh, Northwest Labor Research, which uh, I don't have anymore. I'm I'm sort of supposed to be retired, ha ha. Um, but um, the the he, he had actually gone this step, and I worked very closely with him. His name was Dan Kafton, and uh, I I don't know what's happened to Dan. I think he's retired now, but. Uh, uh, we work together to develop a cross-matching spreadsheet. And this is the case search page. Now, I must point out, if you're trying to match up a employer and a consultant with a particular NLRB uh, representation case, you must proceed very carefully because the employer may have multiple work sites. Um, they may have different addresses than what's listed in the consultant's report. Um, but Looking at the NLRB election uh, information is tremendously illuminating. I mean, we should have the union's name in, in item 12B of the of the form LM20. It's not always listed. Um, so we, we have four points of identification to cross match with the uh, NLRB, you know, the name, the address and location, uh, the dates of the election need to correspond with the dates of the persuader arrangement which you can also get from the LM20 if it's properly filled out. And of course the union, if you can match on all four, then you know you've got a solid match. So here is um, the NLRB search, uh, case search. Uh, I type in Collectivo Coffee, I click search. I get 16 hits. Now notice here on the filter side, we're just looking for representation cases. So we click representation cases we apply the filter and bing, we only get down to one, one case that was a representation case, here it is. Now this is the RC number, 18 is the region, RC means request for certification, and there's a unique case number. There's the date the petition was filed. It's handled by the board office uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it was actually assigned to region 18. And with, when you click the link, you'll get what's called the case activity docket. And there's a couple of parts to the docket. First of all, it'll tell the date the petition was filed, the status, the date the ballots were tallied, how many eligible voters, how many votes were counted, how many votes for the union, how many votes against, and then the reason closed, certificate of representative. If the union wins the election, then and there's no challenge ballots that are dispositive, then the board issues something called the certificate of representative. If the union loses the election, in other words, there's a tie vote or it loses, then you get a certificate of results. Here's the name of the unions. It was also local 1220, which is the, the broadcast local for uh, IBW in uh, Milwaukee. It tells you who all's in the unit. So great information here. You can cross match this back with what's in the, um, the LM20 and see that this is much more complete what the board has. You'll also find in here the key dates. It goes all the way back to the beginning of when the petition was filed. You know, uh, any uh, service of documents. If there's an active hyperlink, you can click that hyperlink and you can get that. So you can get a copy of the board's decision. This is a board directed election, uh, opposition. Uh, of the RD's decision to order. Uh, all that's there. If you want to have more displayed, you can just click here. Also, the, the participants. Uh, when, a, when a ULP or a R case is filed with the board, 
all the eligible parties are sent a notice of appearance so they can have documents served on them. So here's one of the employer's representatives from Godfrey and Kahn, which is a big uh, Wisconsin anti-union law firm. Here's somebody with the Previant Law Firm, which is the big union side law firm in Wisconsin. Here's another one from Godfrey and Kahn. And then here's one that's going to uh, the local union and then to the employer. So you know who all is being served with documents. So you can see who the attorneys for the employer are. Sometimes that can be useful. And then in the report, here's a, a listing of, uh, this is from the, uh, uh, the LM20 that was filed. It says that it began, their service began on 2721. Let's go back up here and see the petition was filed back in 2321. So the RC petition is filed on 23, and uh, the consultant says they entered into agreement on 27. So the consultant was brought in a couple of days after the petition is filed. And the people working on the campaign are Ahmed Santana and Scott Michael. Now you'll notice this is LRI. They have these clever little code numbers that they give. Well, if you if you run across this, give us a call. We 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 broke the key. We, we figured it out. We have a uh, an ultra machine that that breaks the employer's codes. It lists who the people are in the unit, and it just says electrical workers. Well, thanks to the board, we were able to find all the information about that. And how much did the employer get paid? Well, here's one of the LM10s. And they got paid in 2020, they got paid $103,000. Now that's because they were involved in this campaign long before the petition was filed. Okay, you can see the check, they were paid on 1027. So we would go back and pull the other LM20 for uh, LRI to make sure that they were engaged on what date of engagement. And then here's the second uh, one for 2021. And they got paid another chunk of change. They were getting paid $375 an hour. Now, identifying the union, uh, that's uh, something that is really, really important to do because th this is something we do as part of the early warning program. We is Bob gets, and this is something that Brad um, pioneered, um, was getting a weekly data dump of LM20s, right, right, Bob? And this this was huge because you know when when you use the public disclosure website, you can't find this stuff. You have to ask by name. But getting the weekly dumps was huge because this information is should be very timely if it's filed within the thirty days. But the big problem is it may not list the union that's involved. So uh, what we have to do is identify the union and then try to notify them and say, hey, here's an LM20 that's been filed. So we have to match uh, with the union. And uh, typically we're able to do this by, by pulling up the NLRB data. And um, sometimes we just have, if we get a local number, we literally just Google the local union and find the, the principal officer. So like if it's a teamster, it's a secretary treasurer, if it's a, a, you know, a construction union like operating engineers, the principal officer is the business manager. And then we get a phone number and an email and then we're able to contact them and say, hey, would you like to get a copy of the LM20? Would you like some assistance? We think this is huge because uh, now when you cross link it with the NLRB, we're not going to send this information out if the persuasive form was filed a year late. Um, but if it's still timely, and we can tell that by checking the election, like we heard about a, an election in a, in a hospital in uh, uh, Medford, Oregon, uh, involving the Oregon Nurses Association and SEIU Local 49. And, um, you know, the, uh, the form was, was, was filed and the election was literally only about four or five weeks away. But we still sent it to them and said, here's the information. And the primary consultant, GRCA, their CEO last year got paid $664,000. So some really, really valuable information. Um, so sometimes we get the union's name because there's an appearance that's entered on the NLRB paperwork. So, so there, you know, as, as my, uh, my friend used to say, is there's, there's a will, there's a relative. There's always a way to, to get, you know, information about where the union is, is located. 
and then to reach out to them. And this is what we've been doing with our early warning program. And uh, it's just, I think it's gonna be huge, making a big difference. Okay, now, I think it's very important that every time you find a late form, a deficient form, uh, that you file a complaint with OLMS. Uh, if you go to the book, there's a chapter in there about what you need to, to file. There's even sample complaint letters. Um, and uh, you, can, you can file it either with the, the OLMS public address or increasingly what I'm recommending people do is they file it with the OLMS district office. Now, OLMS has a list of district offices on their website. And the reason for going to the district office, it would be the district office nearest to the, the employer, is that uh, they have investigators who are trained in investigating delinquency and deficiency cases. And they, you know, they're always looking to, to increase their numbers and they're incentivized to do so. So I would really encourage you to just, if you find a deficient or a delinquent form to report them. And you might just say, oh, what's the use? Well, first of all, don't expect to hear back from OLMS. Um, like any enforcement agency, any criminal enforcement agency, their, their, their standard comment will be, we do not comment on proposed or ongoing investigations. So that's what you're gonna hear. Um, but if it's a question of filing a form that wasn't filed or filing a deficient form, you can just keep checking. And that's what I do. And sometimes I find, oh, look, they corrected it. And Bob, I think you've had the same experience too. Now, many people say, but, but section 2010 is criminal penalties for failing to file. And section 209 has civil penalties for failure to file. OLMS has never used them. I couldn't find any examples. Um, so, you know, and, and they, they have huge delinquency problems. I mean, even with unions who are supposed to file their LM twos, threes, and fours within 90 days of the close of the fiscal year, in 2022, about 67% filed on time that were not covered by a voluntary compliance agreement. So, you know, if we want to beat up employers and, and persuaders for not filing on time, there will be collateral damage. And, and I think we have to think that through. OLMS's preferred methodology is just to use voluntary compliance. And believe it or not, they're pretty successful with that. Because if, if you have evidence that there was persuader activity going on, there's really no argument. And if they filed an LM20 uh, and it's been filed late and the agreement date is in the LM20 and you can see that they're 354 days late. I mean, you know, here's this is a true story. Um, Amazon retained about in the 2021 period, they spent about $4.3 million on persuaders. In 2022, they spent $14 million on persuaders. Amazon's letter of agreement makes it incumbent upon each persuader to timely file their LM20s and 21 reports. One of the consultants filed her LM20 about a week after she filed her LM21. So it's over a year late. We just, I just saw one the other day. It was from RWP, Road Warrior Productions. It was filed almost 600 days late. I mean, what good is that? But I mean, at least if all of us can, can call them up and say, hey, you got to do a better job because you can research these consultants' filings as a group and find that, that, uh, that they're, as a group, they don't do very good. In fact, on the Labor Lab website, uh, there is a spreadsheet which allows you to research the on-time filing record of any individual persuader. Now, it's a little bit out of date, and Bob, I guess I need, we need to update that, but it's, it's a terrific resource, and, uh, and you, you can get a profile on how late these guys are in filing. Um, here's an example. Um, <laughs> It's a, a persuader called Labor Pros. They're based out of Florida. And I noticed that uh, this is the original form that was filed. And I looked at the period covered because when I cross-matched their 21 with an LM10, the employer reported paying a couple hundred thousand dollars and they didn't report it at all. And then I looked at the dates in the LM21. I brought this to the agency's attention. And a few days later, I got an amended form they used the proper filing date and they cleaned up everything else in the form. So, you know, it's an example that if, if you bring it to their attention, 
uh, they will, generally speaking, get, get the matter corrected. Um, now, you may say, oh, I don't have time to do this. Okay, if you don't have time, call Bob. Call me. We have time. We'll make it happen. And we'll keep you posted. And, you know, again, you're helping us help the agency to clean up this reporting problem. Because to us, getting accurate reporting is the first step. If we have accurate and timely reporting and we have comprehensive reporting, we get rid of the special enforcement policy, we can really educate the public about how much this industry is spending. You know, like so far, we've been keeping track of $34 million spent by persuade, on persuaders in uh, um, uh, 2021. And you know, 2022 is going to be bigger because Amazon accounts for $14 million in 2022 alone. Um, and, 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 you know, that's compared with the NLRB typically takes in about $50 million in unfair labor practice back, back pay payments a year. So it, it, it's, it's a fraction of that. But as we get more and better reporting, we're going to get a better understanding for policymakers and the general public about what a problem this was. And, uh, you know, as uh, Justice Louis Brandeis once said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. This is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we looked at 2021 and 2022. We found 21.6 are filed within 30 days. Nearly 23% are filed six months or, or more. That, that's just unacceptable. For the LM21s, we found for calendar year, uh, uh, 2021, 107 were owed because there had been at least one filing, um, and uh, uh, only 48 have been filed. So the, the 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 delinquency problem just for 2021, and these would have been due in March of 2022. Uh, you know, over half are delinquent, haven't been filed, and that fact's been made aware to OLMS. And uh, as I mentioned, about 48 of the LM21s filed so far for 21, uh, 25 actually itemized payments uh, received from employers for Persuader. And LM10 is not much better. We determined that in 2021, 223 were owed and uh, 51 have still not been filed. So we, we're, we're doing better with the LM10s, but some big employers still need to file. So um, I'll just kind of close with, you know, this is what we're working on now. We, we're building this template and it incorporates everything. And uh, this will be in the, the, the second edition of the book. Uh, I just filled this out for an election involving Virginia Transformers. It was a, uh, uh, a, a, a factory organized by Operating Engineers Local 302 in Pocatello, Idaho. And uh, see, we can embed the hyperlink for the LM20. Uh, we have the location. Here's the consultant. You can click that link and pull up their LM20 report. The persuader agreement date, the filing date. Was there an agreement, uh, an engagement letter? Yes. What was the hourly fee? So all of the information gets incorporated here. And then we find that here were the payments made to the two consultants. It totaled about sixty, about $70,000. And it was a mail ballot election. The union was certified 66 to 45. That's not bad for Idaho. And uh, uh, they, uh, uh, so we record all this information and then we can, we can share it with the union or you can share it with your local if you're a international union researcher or organizer. But it's really, really important that you keep good records. Whenever you uh, locate a 20 or a 21 or a 10, Download it, save it as a PDF because you may not be able to find it very easily again. Uh, I think that's just really, really important. Um, I'm going to just real quickly, if I can, get into the. Um, I mean, I've got more stuff I can show you. Um, yeah, let's let's just show you the. Um, uh, here is a. Uh, um, Trying to get into a uh, the OMS public disclosure website.
Can everybody see this public disclosure website here now? Bob, can you, can you see it? No, it's not up. It's still on the uh, the screen from uh, here. Okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to do this. So let me just. Uh, hmm. Okay. Well, uh, perhaps this is something we could we could you know demonstrate it at a later time. But um, always, 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 when you're doing the public disclosure search, search for the uh, agreement letter. And, and because um, they are just outstanding. Uh, many of them are boilerplate, like LRIs now don't mention any fees. But the, the typical scenario now is that in item 10 of the LM21, they will uh, leave the, um, uh, the, the payment part in item 10 blank, and they will um, not list any fees, and then there will be no letter attached. So you don't have really any information about how much they're getting paid. We find this to be a terrifically useful part of, of, of the information we share with the local unions. So if this happens, we're able with our databases to go back and find out how much they've been paid previously. And, and that, that's still pretty useful. Um, I was working with an IBW local in uh, Illinois and uh, it was a, a gaming company uh, that they were organizing and the company paid $150,000 and there were like a total of 50 people in the unit. And uh, they, the union actually infiltrated a captive audience meeting and these guys were a couple of jokers. And so what we did is at the very end, we calculated how many dollars they spent per no vote. And it was like $30,000 per no vote. And believe you me, the union has been using that in negotiations. We had a a Teamsters local here in Seattle that organized hospital central services, same kind of thing. They brought in a high price consultant. They had very, very few no votes and they just threw it at the union, the, the union threw it in the company's face in negotiations and said, you, know, you, you spent you know, $100,000, you could have spent it on wages and improvements, but you spent it on persuaders. And remember when we talk about these costs, it's not just the cost of the persuader. Uh, as you can see from the appearances on the NLRB documentation, they're also hiring a law firm to go with them as well. So they're spending a ton of money to, to keep the union out. So I see I have just a minute or two. So I, I'm going to just show you one, one last thing here. Um, the um, OLMS has recently uh, put out a, uh, a rule um, that uh, requires uh, a proposed rule that would require more employer reporting on the LM10. Uh, to indicate whether or not they're a federal contractor. Now, the reason this is important is um, my president, uh, <laughs> uh, before I even got there, signed Executive Order 13494. And this orders federal contractors that they uh, can no longer treat as an allowed cost any persuader expenditures. In other words, if, if you go out and hire an LRI or a GRCA or, or, or HMD consultants, and you try to get reimbursed by the government, that's not allowed. You're in violation of federal acquisition rules. And it's possible to bring a complaint with the Office of the Inspector General for that agency and to recoup that money. Um, so this is the, the, the rule that, that, that the, the president signed this uh, executive order and it says such allowable cost shall be excluded from any billing claim proposal or disbursement. And uh, so now uh, this is a, another gift to us from, from then Senator Obama, uh, usaspending.gov. I don't know if any of you have used it, but um, I just, for the heck of it, I pulled up Colectivo uh, uh, Coffee Roasters and boom, I got a hit. And it turns out that they got a $5,000 economic injury disaster loan, I'm sorry, $2,000. But it was at the same time that they were spending $103,000 on a union busting consultant. Now, it's probably too late to do anything about it, but it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, here they are getting $2,000 in you know, economic injury assistance you know, from COVID, and they're spending $103,000 on union busters. So I think as we kind of continue to build capacity, we're opening up new lines of inquiry, new panels. 
And this researching the federal contractor status of uh, employers who hire busters, uh, there's been some success, small, uh, I understood it, it, it's not really great at this stage, but if we start going to the inspector general's office and saying, here's a union busting form, here's an LM10, signed under penalty of perjury that the employer hired union busting consultants. Here's the federal contractor grant number for the same period of time. And here's the executive order and here's the federal acquisition rule. You need to do something about this, especially if you involve your congressional delegation. Uh, there se several congressional members are very, very upset about this kind of stuff. So I think that's, that's opening up a new thing. And, and then lastly, um, is the, the nonprofit organizations. Uh, they file form 990, which is publicly available. They're somewhat out of date, but many of you may not know that if you go to their offices and request the most recent 50, you know, the most recent 990, they have to allow you to copy it. Um, so these 990s are very, very useful to sort of look and see what expenditures have been made and how much money. Uh, I've been working with Bob on, on one campaign where it's, it's a environmental group that's hanging on by its, its, uh, the skin of its teeth. And it went and hired a big uh, anti-union law firm, Littler Mendelssohn, to help them run a campaign, which they lost. And all they did was, you know, they went for a full board election. They, they, they wrote a lot of briefs. They spent a lot of money. So when we see the next year's LM, uh, next year's 990, we're, we're going to see just a huge hole in their budget. So I think there's many, many interesting ways in which we can use this information to put additional pressure on employers, on persuaders, to educate the public. And I think above all, to inoculate members who are trying to organize that, you know, when, when you hear that voice speaking, you know, be, be, be cautious, be careful. I mean, here's the real irony. You know, when I was an organizer, unions were always regarded as being, you know, the outside party. You're a third party. You don't, you don't need a third party. And, 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 you know, look at how much money, look at their LM reports. You know, the, the union, here's the salary of their business manager. Here's, here's how much they took in last year. But they don't want to be bound by the same disclosure and reporting requirements? I don't think so. And, and, and as Bob said, I mean, Bob's just done a terrific job in working with, you know, major media markets and small town papers and, and TV stations and radio stations. They're picking this stuff up because there's, there's an inherent unfairness about this that I think is really going to help us build power, not only in the workplace, but in the communities where we're trying to organize. So I think we have it our, in our hands here a, a terrific tool, and, and, I, and I hope that we'll be able to use them. So um, I think I'll stop there. I think I've, I've taken enough time, and I hope I haven't bored you to tears, but obviously very exciting stuff. Hi, I'm Scott Klinger. I work with National Jobs with Justice, and I just want to really thank uh, John and Bob for a really fascinating presentation. We have uh, a number of questions, so I'm going to uh, pose them, read them, and uh, ask John or Bob to respond. Uh, I'm starting with one from John Lackney, and it's kind of a long question. You can read it in the Q&A if you want. I'm going to pull out one part of it. Uh, if unions send you information on campaigns where we've encountered these people, does Labor Lab have the capacity to store this stuff and make it available to others. I think the labor movement needs a centralized database on these people and firms that would also include things like photos of union busters, other useful background research on union busters like social media links, aliases, bankruptcies, properties they own, criminal histories, and materials from an actual anti-union campaigns, literature, archived websites, et cetera. When do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I really appreciate that question from John, because I think that's one of the, and this actually perfectly dovetails off of what uh, John Lund was just talking about, um, where, you know, the fact of the matter is that the other side has been doing this for a while. Uh, Richard Berman, I'm sure a lot of you, if you've Googled yourself, you pop up on unionfacts.com, where he's got $2.3 million to just go through LM2s. Like they've, they got ahead of us on this, but that's why we are building these dossiers. And we have um, 
We have a bunch built. Some of the larger ones we're still working on, like LRI, which is one of the most prolific. There's a lot of information to go through. The quick answer to the question is absolutely yes. Um, you know, we have what I called the face file, you know, where we're trying to collect as many photos of these people as possible because we get connect, contacted by union organizers who say, we know someone's in the workplace, they're not sharing their name, which is very common. Um, do you, we think that they're a persuader, so we send them over our face file and uh, they look through it and see if it's one of the people in there. So photos, social media, all of that stuff. I mean, these persuaders are definitely taking notice of us. Um, they spend a lot of time. Uh, there's a couple of them that are incredibly militant against us because we've collected so much information on them, whether it's background checks or uh, social media snaps or, you know, or even just the, the alerts that we put out talking about how they're violating the law or the scorecard that I put in the chat talking about how often they violate the law. So yeah, we are we have this all put together in files. Um, we don't have every single persuader done yet. That's obviously something that's time intensive. It takes a lot of work, but please, yes, contact us or send us stuff so that we can continue to build these out. So then when we do the early warning system and reach out to these folks, we have the information to share. And um, just quickly on that point, it really, I know John gave a few examples, but the early warning system does have an impact. Even sometimes it has an impact after a union uh, may have lost an election. Uh, we're working with one group that, uh, you know, the, the mechanics in the shop decided to give the company a second shot. Well, we let them know that the company had also hired an outside party to come and persuade them. The workers weren't aware that they were being paid by getting paid thousands of dollars to come and tell them to vote against the union. And now they've refiled for an election. So, I mean, the, the narrative work here is powerful. Yeah, I have nothing to add. I think that's that's a, a great answer. And, and, and years ago, the, the CIO and the AFL-CIO had uh, Al Kistler, who ran something called Report on Union Busters, and, and maybe we're going to try to bring something like that back. Um, hey, I see there's a couple of questions here. Do you want me to just uh, go into the Q&A and respond to them directly? Would that be okay? Um, well, let me ask one more that I okay. thought was important, and then you can go with it. Um, are there state-level requirements for disclosing persuader relationships? I'm thinking of public employers who deal with state labor boards and not the NLRB. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Part of the problem is that uh, unions that are purely public sector that have, I mean, if you have one private sector member, you're covered by the act. If you're purely public sector, you're not. So no, there are no state law requirements. However, you have state public records laws. So that, um, you know, you, you could certainly, if you knew there was a persuader, and by the way, these persuaders, they, they're, they're not... Uh, locked in just to doing private sector stuff, they'll happily take on public sector work. But I think they stay away from it because the, the state public disclosure laws can be used. So, you know, and again, depending upon the state you're in, I mean, Montana, for example, has an excellent law, even has a public disclosure ombudsman's person to help you with your assistance. Uh, and, and, and in Washington state, the attorney general's office has an excellent manual. So um, in requesting a copy of the agreement, re requesting copies of the billing, requesting copies of any and all electronic correspondence between the consultant and the agency, you could just bury them in, in public records requests and make an issue because, you know, if they refuse to respond, well, then what are they hiding? And if they give you a partial response, they're still hiding stuff. These are public dollars that are being used. And, and that's the other thing, because if you can find some friendly Democratic or other legislatures who don't like this kind of stuff, they can make a big stink about it as well. So I don't think you need an LMRDA to, to fight this in the public sector. I think you may actually have better tools available. Don't you, Bob? Yeah, um, absolutely. And the only thing I want to add on the state level is that we are working with a couple of coalitions in a few states um, that are putting together um, a policy that could be implemented at the state level that is basically like a little LMRDA at the state level. Um, again, this isn't for, for the public side. So this is just on state level stuff with more teeth than the uh, the federal law. So, I mean, I think there has been a wake up in the last couple of years that like this is valuable information. And if the federal government's not gonna step up and enforce it, then maybe in some friendly legislatures we can. Thanks. We have a question from Ben Kreider. 
You mentioned efforts to push for reinstatement of the persuader rule and some other areas where you're trying to put pressure on DOL. How can we help with these efforts? So I accidentally responded to that in the chat. Um, I apologize for not following protocol on that correctly. So what I'll do is throw it in the larger chat. Um, one of the first things you can do is sign our petitions on the special enforcement policy and the persuader rule. We continuously send new signatures to OMS, pushing them to do this. And then if you know, you're know you with an organization or a union, it's not the worst thing in the world to put a letter in le on letterhead and send it to OMS and you can basically put in their general email um, because they, they're responsive to us. You know, they're, we've had meetings with them. They, they are responsive to this pressure. The more pressure we can put on them, the more likely the change is. I saw a question about Railway Labor Act, and, and by the way, um, uh, unions under the Railway Labor Act are covered by the LMRDA. So uh, employers who, who uh, railway employers or, 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 you know, airline employers who we use busters, they're, they're covered by the same law. So they, they would have the same reporting and disclosure requirements. Uh, you just wouldn't have the ability to cross match with the NLRB because the NLRB does not have jurisdiction over Railway Labor Act cases. So that that would be one thing there. Um, so I just I just wanted to, to to make that that clear. And again, uh, you know, certainly feel free. Let's continue the conversation after after the webinar. Um, there was a question too about the standard for filing the LM10. The same, um, yeah. I mean, you you would report uh, reportable uh, you know transaction or reportable persuader activities as outlined in uh, AE. Is there has to be direct employee contact? Yeah. Um, but it can also be under 8F. It can be that there's surveillance that the, the uh, persuaders are doing, or they're doing research on the union. Uh, that would also be reported on the LM10. We have a question that just came from Hiwan Brindle Kim. More and more union busters are reporting, quote, no written agreement on their LM20 filings. This doesn't seem feasible. Anything that can be done to rectify this clear circumventing of the regs. I also noticed some filings that indicate that a written agreement was attached to LM20 filings, but is not a part of the OLMS public filing. Have you right. experienced this? Should we follow up directly to the OLMS? Yes, absolutely. With as much specific information as you can. Um, here's what I recommend you do. Um, do a print screen, save that as a PDF, and somewhere on the PDF, put down the date and time that you accessed that file and got that result. So that they know that you're not just making this up because it could be that, you know, three hours later, they get a filing that substitutes for that. Um, and then send it to um, probably the national office would be the best one. Um, and that's that OMS public uh, website address. And, and Bob, maybe we can we can put that up. Uh, that's Bob typically uses them. And um, if, if it's a, you know, again, we've really got to jump on these lack of the letters. So they say the letters are closed, but it's not. That's a deficient filing. So you say, I'm, I'm complaining about a deficient filing. They check the box, however, the document is not attached. Please see attached screen print, you know, which shows that as of such and such a date and time, this document was not available. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other thing is, uh, it, depending on how much time has elapsed, look at the LM10 report for the employer. And in the, I mean, and again, it will be for typically multiple consultants, but when you find that consultant, they would have to have that letter. Uh, and if that if they do have a written agreement, they would attach the letter. So I've had cases where the LM10 yielded up the engagement letter, but the consultant didn't bother to include it on the LM20. And again, if there's specific cases we can help you with, please reach out to us. Yeah, and just, you know, one other, again, I just want to drive this home, like the more people that are making noise about this, and so that DOL knows that we're paying attention, the better. Um, but the other folks are paying attention too. you know, I think one of the worst, this is just a quick anecdote that this week, I was looking at some attached agreements at, from Reliant Labor, and they had literally redacted the attachment themselves of how much they were getting paid, etc. And submitted that. Um, obviously that looks really bad. So we screenshot that, sent it out to the union that was being targeted, but then we also made a complaint and OMS to their credit responded quickly and saying, you're not allowed to redact what's in these agreements. And we got an update, um, within 48 hours. So that was pretty exciting. 
Eric has a oh. question, then he's going to wrap us up. Okay. Yeah, guys, I saw, I think somebody put in the Q&A. Um, what about if a union is pursuing card check? And I was going to ask a similar question. I'm assuming slash hoping that all this reporting still applies if the union does not file for an election, but is uh, trying to get card check, or if yeah. the workers are organizing just to get improvements. Um, is that true? Yes. Um, yeah, you know, the, 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 what triggers the, the case search, you know, with the NLRB and the case activity document is the filing of a petition. Even if the petition is withdrawn, you know, many of them are withdrawn, you know, because, you know, you don't have the 30 percent or other 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 issues that do come up. But yeah, um, so if you're doing a, a non-board uh, recognition, voluntary recognition agreement like we do in construction, uh, car check, whatever, um, you, you won't have the NLRB filings, but all this other stuff is very, very valuable. And again, you may not find any LM20s that have been filed. Um, you know, check with us. We, we have some some ideas about this too, but, um, you know, that doesn't mean that there's not a persuader in there. Uh, the advantage of the NLRB filing, of course, is that the orders of appearance are entered, so you'll know the names of the attorneys involved. Um, so, so but, but again, you know, the card check, you know, is a great way to organize. And I mean, I've used it myself as an organizer, um, but like you say, uh, there won't be that, uh, the footprints left at, at, as the NLRB case activity document would provide. And just one quick thing to tie on to that is I do, uh, for everyone on this call, I, I we've seen a increase in 2023 of um, LM20s that are filed uh, and that when you were supposed to put where the relevant union is, they're putting pre pre-petition. Um, so one, we're probably seeing increased compliance under this new administration. We don't know completely yet. We're going to have an analysis of that later, which is great. But with the increased interest in compliant, I mean, uh, organizing, excuse me, um, we're seeing a lot more employers hire these people to in an attempt to inoculate um, or, you know, whether there's talk of strikes or things like that. So it's, it's a burgeoning industry for sure. And that's why we're seeing so many subcontractors too. Yeah, and also with decerts or RM petitions, uh, even deauthorization elections, uh, some of the consultants actually specialize in them. Uh, so, I mean, ju just because there's a decert uh, or or a UD, don't don't think that there won't be a persuader. In, in all likelihood, um, there will be, um, and uh, they'll be spreading all kinds of. Uh, you know, uh, information. And again, you know, being able to look at the employers, folks, people and the supervisors and say, gee, you're, you're, you're paying somebody so much money to come in and you know, spread all this stuff. You know, I mean, I think it's just a very powerful way to get back at them. But just don't think that this is all about RC petitions, RD, UD, RMs. It's all there. 100%. Um, let me just ask you something I've always wanted to, to ask. Do you think it's possible for a union to sue a union buster, for example, if they filed late and a timely filing could have impacted the election. So the union yeah. would have standing and, uh, and potentially you know, has more resources to file a lawsuit than the union buster has to defend themselves. Is that something you've ever seen? Uh, Eric, it's an interesting question. Of course, I'm not an attorney, so I cannot offer a legal opinion, but there is no private right of action under the LMRE. DA. So I think it would be difficult. And again, if you try to bring a state law action, they would probably argue very strongly for preemption, even though, you know, it's it's uh, not subject to the same Garmin preemption that the NLRB stuff is. But um, I, I think that it's an argument that should, however, be made um, that, you know, uh, again, you can benefit greatly from the fact that there's now much more cooperation between the NLRB and OMS. This is a good thing. Uh, they signed in 2021 a data sharing agreement that was much more far reaching than the one that I signed when I was director. Um, so they share more information and um, case information as well. So you, you may want to raise it, you know, if you have objections to the election. I mean, let's say it's a, uh, uh, a step cert election and you file uh, objections with the RD. Why not? What have you got to lose? Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, if it's a board directed election, of course, but yeah, I, I think more and more people need to raise this. And uh, because I think if nothing else, we educate the NLRB. And, 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 and uh, I think it can make a difference because particularly in close elections, you know, I mean, how many people bought into that argument? 
that uh, uh, that the, the consultant brought up and 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 it turned out to be completely false. And if you had known it was a consultant where it was coming from, you could have done something. The other thing to watch out for is where the consultants start to act as agents of the employer, where they start to make threats and promises. Uh, there's a case in Las Vegas in, involving Resorts World and Operating Engineers Local 501, where a, a successful unfair labor practice charge was brought by the operating engineers and uh, my good friend, uh, David Rosenfeld. Uh, case was settled and the union got what they want. But here the consultant crossed over from being a consultant to being an agent of the employer committing unfair labor practices. So always be looking for that as well. Got it. Thanks. Really helpful. Um, yeah, Scott, please stay in touch. I, I, I'd like to hear more, more of your thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, Scott, was there another thing in the chat or any other questions that came in? Yeah, just somebody wanted to know, there was a reference to a website right before, right after you mentioned President Obama's uh, executive order. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that, that was, I think the, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, that was the executive order website. Let's see, if, where is that? Um, Oh boy. Yeah, I think we're just going to have to put it up for you because I, I can't seem to access that file right now, but okay. we'll, we'll put it up. Yeah. And 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 also there's um, the, the Federal Acquisitions uh, Resource Council has an administrative rule that can be cited that enforces that. And that's the one that you would cite if you were bringing an inspector general complaint. So we'll we'll um, I'll get that to Bob and we'll get we'll get that posted very shortly. Wonderful. You want to close this out, Eric? Yeah, no, this has been really great. Thanks, uh, Bob and John. Um, this, I, I feel like I follow this area, you know, fairly adequately, but but you have shown that I do not. This is, there's a lot here. And um, thank you, Labor Lab, for collecting all of this stuff. I'm going to um, make sure everyone I know uh, that works in the kind of union area knows about this. Also, for everybody listening, we are recording, and this will be posted on the LRAN website probably in a few days on the resources page. And we may also maybe get some links up there for some of the other stuff um, that's been mentioned so folks folks can see it. And just um, again, uh, the LRAN website is lranetwork.org. Feel free to get on there. Um, you can also sign up for the listserv, hear about the conferences. And we thank everybody uh, for coming on today. And thanks, Bob and John, appreciate it. Thank you so much, LRAN, and thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Bye, everybody.